So the first one would be uh, Beth Israel Synagogue, particularly the second location that Beth Israel had uh, downtown in the Glenora area on 119th Street. Uh, that's my family's always been associated with Beth Israel, and I used to attend as a child. I mostly would go on Simcha Torah because it was a lot of fun watching the Torah being marched around the synagogue. And I was a little girl, so I didn't have to sit in the women's section exclusively. I could sit with my brother and my dad, and it, and it was a lot of fun. And the rabbi would would toss candy to the children, and I remember the um, uh, the beautiful red. Uh, velvety seats that were in the pews in the women's section uh, quite vividly and uh, a number of those pews are now in the current Beth Israel they were they were brought over and they're in uh, they're in the small chapel that's on uh, in the new Beth Israel on the women's side and I, yeah I remember you know the it was always a little bit of a production to get there because my father is Shomer Shabbos and he won't drive on Saturdays. And so we, there was a, um, a rabbi who was in the community at one point who made a minhag that it was acceptable to take the bus if a ticket was used, not cash, and the ticket was pre-torn and carried in an appropriate fashion. So it was always a big deal getting ready in the morning to go and getting having our, our bus tickets and walking to the bus stop. And that was also like the first time I ever, you know, took public transit. And uh, yeah, I got to the bus stop and taking the bus and, and getting off um, by, a, it was some kind of a car, used car dealership, and then walking to the synagogue. And yeah, I just, just uh, there was be, there would be an ice cream party in the basement for the, for the kids. That was always a lot of fun. Um, but I, yeah, eventually it stopped being so much fun because I became a teenager and I had to sit in the women's section and, and you know, I was too old to have, you know, take part in the ice cream, uh, the ice cream party. And uh, being a typical teenager, I sort of lost interest in religion altogether and, uh, you know, kind of got interested in other things and uh, life pulled me in other directions. But uh Beth Israel is part of my life once again in more recent years um, after my mother passed away. Um, of course, we needed a rabbi to officiate the funeral. So my father being Orthodox um, asked for uh, the rabbi at uh, Beth Israel who is currently uh, Rabbi Zali Klayman. And uh, we began attending there again um, my father and my brother are both involved uh, on the board of directors there. And prior to COVID, I attended, I'd say semi-regularly, uh, occasionally on, on Shabbat uh, and the high, the high holidays and special events. So um, probably once uh, restrictions lift and it's safe to do so, I will probably resume, um, resume doing that. Um, Temple Beth Ora has also been a presence in my life uh, here and there over the years. I've attended uh, bat mitzvahs there. I have a friend who never had a bat mitzvah when she was when she was a teenager. So she, for her fortieth birthday, she decided to have the bat mitzvah that she never had at, and she's a part of Temple Beth Ora. So. Um, that's a memory for me there, and that's in the in the location at the uh, in the current location uh, where the Chaver Kadisha also is, and uh, also during COVID, uh, been zooming into a number of services at Temple Beth Ora as well. Um, other places of importance to me would be um, the Jewish Cemetery. Uh, even before my mother's passing, I've always found it a really interesting place. I'm uh, very much interested in history and, and in particular Jewish history. I used to write for the newsletter for the, the Jewish Archives and Historical Society of Alberta, um, of Edmonton and Northern Alberta. And I would uh, occasionally, you know, just go to the Jewish cemetery just to 
um, look at the headstones and see the names of all these people who were founders of the community and people who were really important in the community and also people that I've I've known over the years. Uh, I just find it a really serene and beautiful place and um, like the head the art on on a lot of the headstones is beautiful and just seeing the different headstones from the different styles of headstones over the years how how they changed and 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 uh I, I just find it a very interesting place um i used to attend the holocaust remembrance services they used to be held in the cemetery until they moved to the uh the legislature where the where there is now a a um Holocaust uh, memorial sculpture uh, built by Susan Owen Kagan. As well, um, Bliss Bakery is a place that I tend to frequent because uh, it's the only kosher bakery in Edmonton. Um, and as far as I know, it's the only place in Edmonton where you can get kosher prepared food uh, and I love their donuts. So I'm um, there quite a bit. And um, another place would be Andy's IGA that uh, I, and in, in doing some of these interviews, I'm actually surprised Andy's IGA hasn't come up yet. So I wanted to bring it up because Andy's IGA um, has been one of the only places in the city where you can buy kosher meat. Uh, it's mostly frozen. They do have some uh, packaged, prepackaged deli now that you can get that is not frozen and quite good. And it's the place where uh, people, it used to be like the place people would go to get, do their Passover shopping because they always bring in, you know, I remember the big wall of matzah and all of the, the foods and everything for Passover. There are one or two other groceries in Edmonton that now have a, a a limited Passover and kosher meat selection. But to me, it, I, I will always associate uh, IGA, Andy's I, Valley View IGA has always been the place that my family would do the bulk of its um, kosher meat and uh, Passover shopping expeditions, particularly after there was no longer a kosher butcher in Edmonton. So speaking of that, um, places from the past that are of note to me would be the old Zal's Kosher Butcher and the Edmonton Kosher Deli. Uh, I used to go there with my dad all the time as a child and as a teenager to buy meat. And uh, I knew the owners. I would see Mr. Nate Siegel on a on a regular basis. He was the mashkiach in the community for quite some time. Um, but my favorite person who I'd always see there was Fivel Zelmanowicz, who, would, who, who worked at the front counter. And he was just a very kind man. And uh, when I was a child, like sometimes he would have um, some, some par of chocolate or candy and I'd, I'd wanna buy a chocolate bar and he just gave it to me for free one time. Uh, and he was just like a really warm, friendly person, and uh, I, I'd always enjoy going to the to the butcher shop. Um, my my parents used to order in quite a lot of kosher meat, and specialty cuts. And Fivel always did you know what he could to accommodate my parents' requests. And I remember one time, like the phone rings, and my mother answers, and it's not like, hi. Um, it, it's Fivel here and, and your, your order has come in. It was, I got the veal <laughs> because I guess there was some kind of veal order that my parents had made. And I remember my brother saying, oh my gosh, it's a good thing he got the right number <laughs> because that would have been quite <laughs> shocking to somebody at the other end who would have no idea what he was talking about. So just little things like that. I remember my grandfather visiting. My grandfather was a kosher butcher and he was visiting Edmonton and went, we took him to Edmonton Kosher Deli and got to meet the owners and and the, the butchers there. And, and uh, there's actually a photograph of my grandfather that I'll put on the screen um, of him and Nate Siegel and Noach and Fivel Zalmanovich. 
uh, all together in the um, in Edmonton kosher Edmonton kosher meats that would have been taken in the mid 80s I think I would have been around 11 ish when it was taken um, other places uh, would be the old Jewish Community Center uh, back when it was uh, in the um, I guess it's the Hillcrest Country Club area because that's where the Jewish Archives was located and I was I was writing for the the newsletter for the Jewish Archives so I would always go there to meet with Debbie Schachter who was then the the archivist and uh, to, to look at files and to do research. And uh, uh, it was in a, a very beautiful location. I'd usually ride my bicycle over there and um, spend some time wandering around the area. And other places would be, I guess the last one would be Bonton Bakery. Uh, I, as a little girl, and through even to now, regular trips there. Uh, of course, as a child, I'd go with my father um, to, you know, to pick up bread and and treats. And remembering the little the little gingerbread people that I think they still sell in the Happy Face cookies. And there were a lot of things that they they sold back then that they don't sell anymore that I miss, like the rum cake and um, the homentoshin. Uh, but I remember uh, going there like all the time with my dad. I remember uh, meeting Mr. Edelman, who is the owner. Uh, Mr. Edelman was a Holocaust survivor. So that led my father to tell me, you know, tell me things to, to educate me about the Holocaust. And I remember Mr. Edelman just being really friendly. And I, I really enjoyed uh, going to Bonton as well. Because you know, usually it meant I'd end up with a with a cookie or a treat or something to take home, and that you know, when you're a kid, that's that's a big thing. So, yeah, those I think that would probably cover it. And I would say the one place that is the most still the most similar that's still around, and is still the most similar to the way it was when I was a child would be IGA. Um especially since like Andy himself is still involved <laughs> in IGA. And uh, uh, so I would say that that has probably a very similar meaning for me and a feeling for me when I go there. But like Beth Israel, it's a different location now. Um, you know, Bonton over the years has changed uh, owners uh, a couple of times. Um, the the vibe has changed a little bit. A lot of the merchandise has changed. A lot of what, uh, a lot of the uh, things that I used to go there for on a regular basis, they don't sell anymore. Which is, I mean, that's that's you know, that's just part of of change. That's just part of the way things change over time. So I'm not, you know, I'm certainly not complaining about that. But it, you know, I do feel differently about the place uh, now. Um, and. You know, Bliss Bakery wasn't around when I was a kid, so that's been something more like recent. Um, Beth, temp being you know Temple Bethora, that's something that's more recent. So yeah, I would say that probably Andy's IGA would have a similar feeling for me as as a child and now because it's still around for me to have something to compare it with, and it's a place that hasn't changed all that much really. I probably have to say Beth Israel Synagogue to answer that. As a child, you know, just, it was fun. It was a fun place to go. And uh, it was special because I didn't go very often. And it was always fun because there were, if you were a kid, it was fun. And then that changed when I got older. Uh, and returning there now, as an adult, I have the hindsight to reflect upon how I felt about attending when I was a child. But I think looking at my myself in a more, I guess you'd say mature way um, and wanting to experience services from an Orthodox point of view 
even though I myself am not what you would call observant in an orthodox way uh, is something that I find, you know, I'm getting to know more about the community, but I'm also getting to know more about myself and uh, trying to make connections, you know, in my life. And it, it's for me um, today, a really kind of enlightening experience because somebody with my, shall we say someone who leans in the political direction that in which I lean, which is quite far to the left. Um, people like me are not usually found in orthodox spaces. At least that's been my experience. So for, for me to navigate an orthodox space as uh, as, as the, the person who I am, I'm finding it very interesting and I'm finding it a learning experience for sure. I would say that a few years ago, it's not even something I would really have given a whole lot of thought to because like, why would I, why would I, why would I really concentrate about or think about that? Um, you know, I, I wasn't really involved in any religious community a few years ago, and it wasn't something that particularly um, interested me. But, you know, cycle of life events happen and, and that those tend to be the times that we connect to our, to our cultures and to our heritage. So that is more when I started thinking about, you know, you know, Beth Israel was the choice because that that was what my father uh, wanted. And that's the synagogue that he's always been affiliated with. And then when he and my brother started attending um, regularly, I figured, you know, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a chance. And sometimes it's important for us to step out of our comfort zones and to mingle with people who have different views than we do. And I think that, yeah, I think that if you're always in your own echo chamber, you don't have the opportunity to grow than you do if you step out of your comfort zone. And it doesn't mean you have to agree with everybody and it doesn't mean they, they have to agree with you, but, um, but it's important, you know, as people to grow and learn over life and to um, reflect, reflect on who you are. I think that a space, a physical space might be less important now than it did say even like 20, 25 years ago. Now, and, and COVID has really shown us this, we can be connected in ways without necessarily having a space. I've been zooming in to synagogue services in Vancouver and making new connections and meeting new people. There are things now that simply were impossible even 10 years ago, even five years ago. So I'm not sure having a physical space is as much of a need as it was in past generations. And certainly there are spaces now that are Jewish spaces, but are used interdenominationally or for like special events where Jewish people from, from different backgrounds come together. We see that happen in all of the synagogues um, at the Jewish drop-in center at, uh, and there are, are Jewish events or Jewish related events that happen in places that are not even traditionally Jewish, like the Heritage Festival in Harlech Park, like the Jewish Film Festival, which is held in a variety of locations, like um, um, the Holocaust Memorial, uh, 
event that's held on the legislature grounds. There are Jewish connections to places now to, to we're making Jewish connections in places that are not historically Jewish. So to have like one overarching space, I don't know, it almost seem, it would almost seem not, not as necessary now.